All right. Well, good morning. Um, all right. Listen fast. If you listen fast, then I'll preach fast. All right. Uh, Heavenly Father, just uh, we thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you're doing here this morning. Lord, um, would you breathe upon your word this morning? I know you've been touching hearts just like you love to do. And, and we love to be touched by you. So, Lord, do it again through, the, through your word. Um, help me to communicate all the things that you put in my heart for your, good, for your glory and for our good. Amen. All right. Well, last week, uh, if you were here, it's okay. If you weren't, I'm, a, I'm going to do a, a recap, 30-second recap here. But we started talking about the book of Esther. This is really hot. Can we, is it too loud, Chris? Okay. Started talking about the book of Esther, and um, it, it's an amazing story. It's an amazing book in the Bible. Um, how many of you took the opportunity to go home and read it this week? It's only 10 chapters long. Uh, you can read it in 30 or 40 minutes. It's, it's pretty powerful. It's a standalone adventure. It's almost like it's made for Hollywood because it had, it's just full. the story is full of intrigue and espionage and suspense, defiance to authority, lust for power. There's risk and courage, heroes and villains. And as we'll see this morning, there's jaw-dropping plot twists. How many of you like that in a good movie? Well, guess what? Esther didn't copy Hollywood. Hollywood copied Esther. Okay, the, the, the blockbuster movies that have all of those elements, it's, it's because that's the way God has written the human story and stories like Esther. Okay, the, the, these stories in the Bible long preceded the stories that you love uh, from, on the big screen or on your TV. Um, but the, it was a story about a Jewish orphan, right, who became queen. That's, that's pretty amazing, queen of a pagan empire. Um, the, it, it talks about her astounding beauty. It talks about her courageous stand, putting her own life at risk on behalf of her people. We were introduced to her cousin Mordecai, who leveraged his own wisdom and influence to help her succeed and reach her destiny. That's what we really focused on last week, how he stayed engaged with her. Even, even, though, even after he had raised her, he stayed engaged, connected with her, interceded for her with divine insight and strategy, and how they partnered together. We saw the beauty of cross-generational partnership to contend against the decree of death that was aimed at the people of God. That's a pretty powerful story, isn't it? But we stopped halfway through, right? And one of the questions, though, as you, as you look at the book of Esther, is where does God fit into the story? I, I just, I'll just tell you, I was a little bit uncomfortable. Last week, I shared the whole time and never talked about God. That, I don't like that. I think Sunday mornings is the time to teach and preach about God. And, and last week I didn't. It was all about Mordecai and Esther and how they partnered together. It's valuable. But where does God fit in the story? It might surprise you that God is never mentioned not one time in the book of Esther. Are we meant? Maybe we're meant to come away in awe of Esther. Maybe we're meant to come away from that story marveling at Mordecai. Well, in fact, there is another in the story. There is another working behind the scenes in a hidden way, accomplishing things that Esther and Mordecai could have never done on their own. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. Now, we've got to tell the rest of the story we, I left you hanging last time. Esther and Mordecai had this conversation, right? Um, there, there was a villain named Haman who had decreed death and total annihilation for the Jews. Mordecai pleaded with Esther to use her, her position as queen, to use her place of privilege in order to 
intercede for her people. Esther had vowed to come before the king at the risk of her own life. They had both agreed together to join in a fast. Esther said, you get your people to your generation, perhaps, to fast. I will get mine to fast. We'll do this together. And then she said, I will do it. I'll go before the king. When they joined together in a fast, it put them together It put them in line with a long history of the people of God fasting for God to break through. That's the closest hint we have in the book of Esther to God is right there. When they decided, let's call a fast. It's implied they're fasting not to make themselves skinnier, not to make themselves more powerful, but it's a, car, it's a cry out to God to break through and do what they can't do on their own. And so we saw this in Esther 4, that, that exchange. Mordecai told Esther, this is where we get those famous words, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's powerful. It's so powerful as he speaks identity over her, over Esther. And she replied, go gather all the Jews and hold a fast and so forth. And she said, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, And if I perish, I perish. <laughs> It's pretty powerful stuff. Bold and courageous, both of them were. And they partnered together to take on the evil of their day. Esther, okay, so the story goes on. Esther invites the king to a feast. The king and his right-hand man, the villain named Haman. And so you may know the story. They, they come to the feast, and, and Esther, uh, she's not ready to make her appeal to the king. So she invites them again the next night. She said, okay, uh, come, to the, come to another feast, and then I'll make my request known to you. The, the, Esther 5 describes how Haman's fury was just growing towards Mordecai. We talked about that last time. Haman goes on to recount to his wife and friends He gathers his wife and friends and tells them how powerful he is. He recounts to them his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions that he had received at the, king, at the hand of the king, and how he, he, the king had advanced him above all the other officials and the servants of the king. And then Haman said this, Even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast that she prepared, and tomorrow also I'm invited by her together with the king. Yet all this, this is Haman's words to his wife and friends, yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate refusing to bow before me. Then his wife and all of his friends suggested to him, let a gallows be built 75 feet high, In the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. And then you can joyfully go to the feast without having to worry about him anymore. It says the idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. And so the story is getting worse. <laughs> Even though we saw the, the courageous declaration of Mordecai and Esther, the story is still turning south. As Haman plots now the death, the immediate death of Mordecai. It just so happens the book describes that very night that the king can't sleep and is reminded. He, he, call, he actually calls for his servants, come, uh, help me. Um, help me be at peace, help me to fall asleep perhaps. And they bring books and they read from the books of the, the it says the chronicles of the acts of, of the king. And it said they happened to read of the time, they reminded the king of the time that Mordecai saved his life. And the king decides to honor Mordecai for it. So the next day, The very next morning, Haman, the villain, comes to the king, and the king says this fascinating thing. What shall be done for the man that the king wants to honor? Of course, Haman thinks he's talking about himself. So Haman pours out this lavish description of what the king should do. 
said, oh, you should, you should bring the man, put him on a horse that only the king has ridden, dress him up in all the royal finery and, and basically have a parade for him. Have one of your top servants go forth, your top officials go before him and declare to all the crowds how valuable of a man this is, how great of a man this is. He thinks, Haman thinks he's the one that's about to get honored. And we see this stunning plot twist whenever the king says, all that you just described, Haman, go and do that for Mordecai the Jew. Gosh, can you imagine? Oh my gosh, Haman must have been seething on the inside. Now what was he to do? In his, in his allegiance to the king, he has to do this very thing, the, the last thing in the world that he would ever want to do. It, it, it's a stunning turn of events, isn't it? And so he does it, and, and of course, he, and he, the parade is over uh, that morning, and he's just beside himself at what he just had to do. And, but then the, 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 the next feast comes, so later that day. He says, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to speed through the story because, believe it or not, the best stuff is yet to come. <laughs> so they get to the second feast, Esther and the king and his right-hand man, Haman. And the king says, what is your request? And Esther replies, king told her, you could have up to half my kingdom. Maybe that was an exaggeration, but the point is, you could have whatever you want, Esther. And Esther replies, it says, only her request, only that my life would be spared and my people saved from annihilation. The king is taken back. What, what do you mean? Who has set themselves against my queen and her people? And she turns and exposes Haman. She said, this one right here in our very midst, he's the one. And the king erupts in anger. And he walks out of the room. The Bible describes this. The story describes how he walks out of the room in anger, probably consulting what should be done about his right-hand man who has set himself against the queen. And it says that he comes back, he comes back into the room just in time to see Haman pleading with Esther, have mercy on me, Esther, for the, he knows the king is, it means ill toward him. And he comes back just in time to see Haman falling onto the couch of Esther, pleading with her, and the king interprets that as Haman is actually being aggressive towards Esther in that very moment. Says, is he going to um, exploit the queen right here in front of me? And immediately sentences Haman to death. Says, so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king subsided. What a turn of events. It's that, that it, it's supposed to be a shocking turn. The very gallows that he built to hang Mordecai on that very day now became his gallows. You see, the enemy come to nothing. All of his plans and all of his schemes, schemes get turned upside down. He gets caught in the very trap that he set for Mordecai. Not only that, and, and I mean, we could, there, there's so much to talk about that I'm not going to. But even it, following that, it says Mordecai was given the place of honor. Not only did he get the parade, but now the king just executed his right-hand man. And it actually, the, the Bible describes that now Mordecai was promoted to that very place. Mordecai became the right hand of the king. So he gets honored for his role in what he had done. Now, that's the story. It goes on a little bit more. You can read it. There's great details in there that we just don't need to cover. Or, I mean, I don't want, I'm not going to cover them today because there's another player in this drama. 
There are things that are happening all throughout the story that as, as big of a role as Mordecai and Esther played in the story, there's all kinds of stuff happening that is beyond their control. They don't have a role in. They can't do anything about. And I would just suggest to you that this is the glory of God. This is the hidden hand of God at work. In fact, the glory of God is highlighted in this book in his hiddenness. I like to call it his invisible hand of providence. Think about some of these events. Esther was raised by Mordecai. Why? Because her parents had perished. We don't know the details of that. We just know she was an orphan girl. And Mordecai raised her. Esther being chosen by the king. Think about these All of these different events that Mordecai and Esther had little, if nothing, to do with, if anything, to do with. Mordecai catching wind of the plot to assassinate the king and exposing it. The king unable to sleep the night before. This was a remarkable, this whole story is a remarkable example of providence in action. King Ahasuerus cannot sleep. And he can choose 20 different diversions to fill his sleepless night, but he commands that a book be brought to him and read. Of all the books that were available, even of all the chronicles of the kings, of the the times of the kings, the one commanded to bring the book could have brought any of those. But he brought the one particular book that happened to have Mordecai's story in it. And of all the places he could have read, all the pages he could have opened up to, it was open to the exact page telling the story of Mordecai and how he saved the king from assassination. God guided every step along the way. The king walking in after he had been enraged at Haman, and then walking back into the room at the very moment when Haman was falling onto the couch of Queen Esther. All of, these are, all of these events are things that Esther had no control over. Mordecai had no control over. Some, he had some control over some of it, and Esther had some control over some of it. But there was so much, so much of the story that they have no influence over at all. We miss the point entirely in the story of Esther. We miss the point entirely if we think of these things, all these events, as luck or coincidence. The entire story is one of intentional sovereignty, which means God is working behind the scenes, orchestrating events that no one else can, actively driving the story forward. Yeah, God's not mentioned in the book, but his handiwork is all throughout it. That's the point. It's implied you see this invisible hand moving the story forward. Things that nobody else could have done. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He was a great preacher in the a uh, couple of centuries ago. Said the book of Esther is a record of wonders without a miracle. And therefore reveals the glory of God in a manner quite different than what's seen in the overthrow of Pharaoh through Moses. What a contrast. During Moses' day, there was a sentence of death on the people of God. And God broke through in incredible, miraculous ways, signs and wonders at every turn to deliver His people. And here we see the people of God delivered with no signs and wonders at all. Does that mean God wasn't involved? Of course He was involved. It's His hidden hand of providence, however. This is where we find ourselves in the story. We live most of the time, most of the time quite at the mercy of other people's choices and actions. Likewise, unable to see what God is up to. Isn't this where you and I live? People make decisions all the time that affect us. Things happen beyond our control all the time. Some good, some bad. 
This is where we live. And I just submit to you, when we read the story of Esther, we should see ourselves in the story of Esther. There's things happening all the time to us that we don't have any control over. And the greatest thing to glean from this book is that God is at work behind the scenes, even when we don't see it. Even when, we don't, even when it seems like the miracles aren't happening, God is still doing wonders in our life. Of course, this is captured by the, the passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Some of you, undoubtedly, it's your favorite passage in the Scriptures. God works, we know, and we know, it says. We know, we believers know this in a way that unbelievers don't. People in the world don't know this the way we believers know this. It says, we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love Him and are purposely called by Him. What a powerful Scripture, what a powerful promise. This is the, the promise that was driving the whole story of Esther. And I, I just want you to want to tell you, this is different than fate. The world, much of the world believes in fate. Oh, whatever will happen will happen. There's nothing you can do about it. This the biblical concept of God working. Everything together for the good of his people is not the same as fate. It's a very different concept. We're not talking about some impersonal force controlling the universe. We're talking about a personal God who's actively involved in your life and my life. Actively driving the story forward. You say, well, what? but I look around and things aren't good. This says that God's working it out for good, working things together for good. And I look, and that wasn't good, and that wasn't good. What do we do with that? A lot of people, they abandon the faith because of this. I say, well, you said that everything would be good, and it's not. Just look at my life. It's not good. I, lo I love the, the quote. I, I, I don't know who said it first. I've heard it from many of you. In fact, the first time I ever heard it came from some of you right here in this room, is that if you look around and things aren't good, it's because God's not finished working it together yet. There are, there's lots of things around us that aren't good yet. God's working them all together for our good. That's the story of Esther. You might look and say, well, it wasn't good that she was orphaned as a kid. Well, it wasn't good that... This and that. Well, that's the point of the story, is to see how God were, was working behind the scenes, working it all together for our good. I want to go on. It's the assurance. This verse in Romans 8, 28, gives us the assurance that God has a plan and will absolutely accomplish it through the good, the bad, and the ugly. We see that in the story of Esther. Now, here's the best stuff. I just want to, I want to encourage you to, to, to wake yourself up. Shake yourself. Wake up. Pay attention. This is the best stuff. It's kind of like Jesus at the wedding of Cana, right? He turned the water into the wine. It was the best stuff. Saved the best till last. Those people, if you fell asleep in the midst of the celebration, you're going to miss out on the best stuff. You might ask, how does God do this? It sounds great. How does God work, to work everything together for our good? How did he do it in Esther? Well, he does it through the real choices and actions of human beings. That's what we see through the story. God's will is accomplished, and yet men are perfectly free agents. We see that in Esther. We see it today. Haman did exactly as he pleased. King Ahasuerus did what he wanted. So did Esther and Mordecai. We see, no, we see no interference or coercion from God in the story. They all do their will and bear full responsibility for it. Yet God works out His eternal plan for the ages through it all. 
Even the smaller players in the drama, there were more characters. Remember Vashti. Vashti was the queen who got kicked out. Why did she get kicked out? Because of a choice that she made. I think it was a good choice. I think she was choosing not to be exploited by the king any longer. The assassination attempt, those two guys were doing what they wanted to do too. They, were set, they set out on a plot to assassinate the king, and they were exposed. Haman's wife and friends, they all did what they wanted to do too, as they encouraged Haman, oh, make a gallows, go after Mordecai, don't put up with this anymore. All the characters in the story did exactly what they wanted to do. The same is true today. This is our confidence in believers in a one true God, in the one true God. He is working everything together for our ultimate good, for His ultimate glory, but He does it through the choices and actions of human beings, not in spite of them. Now, th- th- these are difficult things to talk about and think about it. And, and I just suggest to you, I, I just want to submit to you, that I've wrestled over how to talk about the sovereignty of God, what, this concept that God is in charge and God is driving the story forward. How do you talk about that when there's so much pain and despair and people that you're talking to have great hurt in their lives? They've been sinned against. How do you talk about these things? And I feel like I've learned some things over the decades that have been helpful. I didn't always talk about this topic in a helpful way. Maybe you know somebody like that. It's hard to talk about. I've learned a few things. Here's one that I've learned. When you're talking about God's hand, God's invisible hand orchestrating the events of our lives, you're wrestling with it. What, how does that work? Because this was bad. That person, what do you mean God orchestrated that? How could that be? It's helpful to don't use words like causes, God causes. I used to quote the the Romans 8.28 at one translation that that I learned it in said, God causes all things to work together for good. Now, I I don't use that translation anymore because people stumble over the word causes. Causes. The word causes conjures up some bad ideas that aren't biblical ideas. It gives the idea that uh, you end up blaming God for evil in your life. Oh, God caused that? Oh, he, okay, that means he's responsible for that evil. That's not the way the Bible talks about it. I, I would encourage you when you think of this, don't think in terms of causing. Think in terms of God working through all the things in your life to bring good out of it. God, we know that God works all together, all things together. Not God causes all things. God works all things together for our good. It's a better way to think about it. When we talk about God causes, or we think about, we talk about, we use the word God's will, we throw that away around all the time. Man, was this God's will for that to happen? Well, what about this? Is that God's will for that to happen? Those aren't helpful things to talk about. It's more helpful, I just want to submit to you, it's more helpful to think about what is God working, what is God doing in the midst of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes, there's ugly things in our life. There's good that we didn't deserve. There's bad that we didn't deserve. There's ugly things happening to us that, we shouldn't, have, that shouldn't have happened. Don't think, of, did God cause this? Was that God's will? Was this God's will? Instead, think, what is God doing with all of that stuff to turn it into something good? God is working all of those things together. We start talking about causing and God's will. We, we end up blaming God for evil, which the Bible doesn't do. We end up undermining human responsibility. We say, well, if God's doing it, then what can I do? I'm not responsible for my actions. What do you mean God made Pharaoh do that? What do you mean God caused... You mean God caused Hitler to do what he did? You mean God caused those people to put Jesus on the cross? What does that mean? Does that mean they're not responsible for it? Does that mean Hitler's not responsible? If God made him do it, why not? Why is he responsible? You see the problem with that? Don't talk like that. The Bible doesn't talk like that. 
God can't be blamed for evil. It says that real quick, real clear. And you know what else it says? It says people are responsible for their own actions. That's what it says. Just like in this story. Every person in the story did what they wanted to do. That makes them responsible. When we talk about God causing this or that, it it breeds complacency as well. I remember uh, uh, in the last election, one of my family members said, I I don't have to vote. It doesn't matter. God's going to put into office whoever he wants anyway. That's not the way the Bible talks about it. That's not how it works. God works through the choices and actions of human beings, not in spite of the choices and actions of human beings. We see that all throughout the book of Esther. Never do we see that, oh, well, Haman wanted to do this, but God made him do something different. Esther wanted to do this, but God somehow forced her to do something different. You never see that. The people did what they wanted to do, and they're responsible for the things that they did. Our choices matter. Our actions actually matter. I encourage you to to think, think of yourselves less like actors in God's screenplay and more like players on God's team. Sometimes the concept of a, of a screenplay, well, God's the screenwriter and the, the director, and we're just actors uh, in the drama. Okay, that's helpful a little bit, but in a drama, in a movie, in a screenplay, the actors don't get any choices in the matter and what they're doing. They are just doing what the director tells them to do. That's not the best picture. It's not a helpful picture of the way God interacts with human beings. Here, over the decades, I've... I feel like a better picture is to think of yourself like players on God's team where he's the coach or the manager, where it takes many different parts working together to accomplish his will. Isn't isn't that what we saw in Esther and Mordecai? Everybody had to do their part. They partnered together. They partnered with God himself to see it all come to pass. I think that's helpful. I want to tell you that, that... You're the quarterback of your own team. Every one of you here are the quarterback in your own story. That means you have more role. You have more responsibility than anybody else in your life in your story. You can't just say, well, I'm just just a lineman. I don't really have any say in my life. I'm just a victim here. I'm just at the mercy of everybody else around me. That's not the way the Bible talks about it. The Bible says that we are agents of our own destiny. In other words, we're the quarterback of our own team. We're the ones that have the greatest responsibility under our coach, the greatest responsibility for our team. Many other people are involved on the team. Many other people are helping you succeed, just like you're helping other people succeed. I'm the quarterback on my team. I've got... I've got my wife over here who's my right-hand man helping me. Guess what? She's the quarterback of her team, of her story, and I'm helping her. All of you are helping. We're all helping each other on the team. But God is our coach. Guess what else? In a team, in a team sport or any competition, we have a real enemy who's trying to stop us. I think it's helpful to think of it this way. We're like players on God's team. We have a real enemy who's trying to thwart us at every turn. And our choices matter. And if we give up, we lose. And the closer we follow the directions and the instructions of our coach, the more successful we're going to be. You see how that works? But we have a real enemy who comes against us. He's trying to stop it. It's not going to be easy, in other words. We're out there fighting because there's somebody fighting against us. In the, in the game that I'm describing, we never run out of time, though. We never run out of time. God's not on the clock. He doesn't have to worry, oh, man, we were so close, but time ran out and we lost. It doesn't happen. That, that's not the way our story works. We have so much time, in fact. We have a lifetime. 
our game that we're in, that you're the quarterback of, that God is your coach or your manager, it lasts your entire life. And, and even though there's an enemy and sometimes people get hurt, sometimes there's casualties or, or people get harmed, guess what? There's plenty of time for you to recover. You're not out of the game. It's not like a 60-minute football game where you get hurt, man, you're done for the rest of the game. Too bad. It's not like that. You have time to recover and get back in the game. You get hurt by somebody else. You get hurt by a real enemy who's out to steal and kill and destroy you. You can go to the sideline. You might have to go to the sideline. You might have to come off, come out of the, the, the game for a few minutes, for a, a few months, even a few years. And you get healed up. You get fixed. And you get to get back in the game. This is the story. This is the story, the biblical story of you and me. We don't ever run out of time. We never get to the place where we're disqualified from playing anymore. Because we have a coach who knows how to get us healed up and get us retrained and get back into the game. This is God's role as a coach. Does God control everything that happens out there on the field? He can't because it's run by people out there on the field. Some of the people are going to make good decisions. Some are going to make bad decisions. Some are going to cheat. Some people on your team or the other team might cheat. Okay? God doesn't control like puppets everybody out there on the field. No coach can do that. Of course, God's greater than a coach, but I'm just using this analogy to help us understand. But what he does is he is excellent at strategizing and scheming and, oh, you want to do that, enemy? Okay, I got this play that we can do instead. Oh, you're... You need to be healed up. Let's pull you out for a while, get you healed up, and get you back in the game. The best part about this analogy is God's never lost. Our coach has never lost a game before, and he's not going to. He's not ever going to lose. He's infinitely wiser, smarter, better equipped than, our, than the opposing coach. He, and he has a lifetime working with us to equip us to succeed to equip us to prosper. To, he sees a weakness over here. Oh, well, you're having a hard time with that? Let's just come over here. I'll train you up. I'll show you how to win that. I'll show you how to win the next time you face that, you face that battle. That's the way our God does it. You see the interaction between God and his people. That's what we saw in the book of Esther. That's how God accomplishes his will is he interacts with you and me to do it. He works through the choices and actions of every human being. This highlights, the last thing I want to talk about, it highlights God's humbleness. You think, what, how, what, do, you, what do you mean? What, how does that work? You know, I, I'm amazed that God, the God of the universe, the creator of all things, this God who, whose power is unparalleled, who all of human history combined can't even scratch the surface in comparison to God's power. And you know what he does? He yokes himself with human beings to accomplish his will. That's amazing. That's part of his glory. That's part of the glory of God. That he doesn't just, can you imagine <clears throat> the coach, uh, I'm out there coaching my eighth graders, and can you imagine me seeing that, oh man, no, that's not right. Here, you get out of here and I'll go out there and do it. Okay? I don't need, you guys are messing stuff up, I'll just do it myself. Okay? God doesn't do it that way. God, there's this humility about God, even though he could do it. He could do it any way he wants. All he has to do is, you know, give a little wink or a little snap of his little spoken word to accomplish everything he wants. What does he do instead? He yokes himself with you and me to get it done. God says in the book of Esther, I'm going to work through the, the courageous stand of Esther. I'm going to work through the wisdom and the experience of Mordecai. This man who... who uh, partnered, who um, staked himself to Esther to see her succeed. 
God says, that's what I'm looking for to work through. It's an incredible partnership. God yoking himself together, that's incredible humility. It's like the, <laughs> it's like the, the elephant and the ant walking across the bridge. The ant's riding on the elephant's back. You know, and was the ant going to say, oh, look what we did. Look what we did. Did you see that? We just walked that big old bridge. And the elephant's, yeah, yeah, we did that. God doesn't mind that. He's humble, even though he could do anything he wants. He purposely connects with you and me, partners with you and me to see it done. Even salvation works this way. This is the last scripture that I have for us. This is amazing. This is, how even, this is even how God saves people. You would think, man, of all the things in the world that God can do, saving people, that's his domain. It is his domain. But how does he do it? He does it through you and me. He does it by partnering with you and me. This passage from Romans 10 says it so well. He says, so then, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how can people call on him if they've not believed in him? How can they believe in him if they've not heard his message? How can they hear if no one tells the good news? And how can people tell the good news if no one sends them? The very act of saving human beings from sin. Yes, Jesus did the decisive work on the cross. He did the part that only he could do. And now God looks to you and me to do our part. He says, I won't even save people today without working through men and women. The choices and the actions of human beings. God won't do the children's ministry for this church by himself. God won't do the declaration of the, of the word Sunday after Sunday. He, God won't lead the worship by himself. God won't dig the ditches or do the plumbing or do the counseling. He won't do any of that by himself. Does that mean he's not doing it? No, he's yoking himself with you and me to see it done. God won't save your neighbor by himself. He won't even share the good news with your neighbor by himself or with your coworker. God won't help that person who needs help. God won't pray for the person to be healed. He's waiting for you and me to do that. He's waiting for us to do our part, and we can count on him to do his part. Let's all stand to our feet. I posed this question earlier. Is this story, are we just supposed to marvel at Mordecai in this story? Are we just supposed to be in awe of Esther? It is. It's inspiring to see them, to see their actions. We should be inspired by their actions. I think that's part of the point of the book. But the greater emphasis of the book is for us to Worship the God who's at work behind the scenes. We should, be, we should marvel at the, at the humble God who would yoke himself together with sometimes sinful human beings, sometimes weak, sometimes broken, sometimes sinful human beings. God partners with us anyway to accomplish all of his good I, I kind of like that picture. I kind of like the idea of a God who uses me, values what I have, what I bring to the table, it empowers me to do more than what I could on my own. It's a pretty cool picture. I hope you see the glory of God in the story of Esther, even though he's never mentioned. Just like in our lives, 
we live most of our days, we don't see God do some miracle. We just live out, we act, and we make choices. Other people make choices and act. Sometimes it impacts us. The choices we make certainly impact the people around us. God's working through it all, working everything together for our good and for His glory. That, that's a God that I love to worship. It's worthy of our worship. It's worthy of our devotion. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you and we love you. We thank you for this picture that we see. Thank you for helping us to see our own selves in the story. Lord, most of all, thank you for working both in invisible ways and invisible ways. Lord, give us eyes to see you. Sometimes we need those glimpses. We need to see glimpses of what you're up to. We need to be encouraged. Pray that you would do that for us. And in those times when we can't see, Lord, help us to walk by faith. Help us to trust you. Trust in the invisible God, as the word says. There's something precious to you, I know, from your word. When people trust you, even when they can't see you. Help us to trust you like Mordecai, who said, Esther, even if you don't do anything, the people of God will still be delivered. God will raise up somebody else to do what you didn't have the courage to do. Help us to have that confidence in you as we go about our lives. Amen.